Hey folks, previously I mentioned Code on the Beach. That same group is hosting a conference on a cruise ship, Code on the Sea. It's a five-day cruise from Jacksonville, Florida, to the Bahamas, stopping in Nassau and Half Moon Cay, from February 28th through March 5th, 2015. Now, these sessions are going to be held on sea days, so you'll have enough time with your family, plenty of time on the ship, explore the Bahamas through some excursions, and then you'll get to soak in that warm weather in early March. It's uh, sounding better than spending the week back home where it's cold. Speakers will include Eric Meyer, Michael Feathers, and Greg Young. So check out Code on the Sea at codeonthesea.com, and you can save $150 with coupon code Hanselman. Now, again, that website is codeonthesea.com. Check it out. From Hanselminutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 432. In this episode, Scott talks with David Catu about learning WebGL and making 3D HTML games. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we're going to be talking about WebGL and the Babylon JS engine with uh, David Catu. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Thank you very much for inviting me. No, absolutely my pleasure. So I'm trying to get my head around all these different APIs. You know, it seems like in the last few years, browsers have uh, exploded in the number of things that they can do from ge- geolocation and simple APIs like that to more deep APIs like WebGL. Uh, would you consider WebGL to be part of what we say when we say HTML5? Absolutely. It's broader than HTML5, but yeah, For sake of simplification, we can say that it's part of HTML5. And when I go to the Can I Use website, caniuse.com slash WebGL, uh, it seems like uh, while there's not necessarily broad support, particularly around mobile, uh, near future is going to include iOS. That seems like the beginning of the broad, broad adoption of WebGL. Absolutely. Uh, it started with Chrome, then Firefox, and then IE. And right now we have WebGL on Windows Phone, on almost all Android stuff. And with the announcement of uh, Apple moving uh, WebGL onto iOS, yes, we can say that right now we have a powerful tools to do 3D almost everywhere. When when someone is thinking about canvas, when someone makes a canvas and just wants to draw a a circle, this would be 2D, they would do this just with the canvas API? Yeah, I think so. We have some good frameworks around there like CreateJS, which also use uh, WebGL as an, a tool for accelerate uh, 2D, but you can do that directly using the canvas and it will be uh, in a way accelerated by the browser. You can use 2D or 3D. Okay. And this, this idea of what's accelerated and what's not is becoming a Big, big discussion. I, I had a chat with Christian Heilman uh, recently where he talked about the differences between doing animations in CSS3 and doing them in jQuery and how dramatic there's dramatic improvements when you use an API that the browser is aware of at a hardware level and can then say, oh, I can use the GPU. I can Absolutely. use the, the, the graphics card for this. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a real challenge for web developers today. I hope that in the near future, jQuery will be able to detect that some animation can be done with CSS. And I think for more, a part of them, it's already the case. Uh, we did the same thing with WinJS. Some of the animation of WinJS are just done using CSS3 animations. So yeah, it's a bit complicated today, but I hope it will be simpler in the near future. Mm-hmm. I see people talking about CSS in the context of 3D, when should someone do their CSS or do an animation in CSS and a 3D transform versus when is it time to jump to WebGL? Uh, let's say that for simple things like uh, rotating some uh, divs or just adding some kind of perspective to your uh, to your page, it could be easily done with CSS 3D transform uh, because 
mainly CSS 3D transform is just applying a matrix, a 3D matrix to your div. If you want to go further, I mean, adding more complex uh, object, uh, something that, that it's not a square, but like uh, a shape, whatever you want, you need to go to uh, WebGL. Okay. So if I was going to draw a square and rotate it or translate it or scale it in X, Y, or Z, these are all very reasonable things to do with the transform property in oh, CSS. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you will get right off the, all the burden of using WebGL because WebGL is not easy to use. It's low level and it's not easy to use. Okay. But if I wanted to draw a cube, something that actually has depth, then if I wanted to do that in CSS, it becomes more of a challenge. And I assume oh, yeah. I would then have to start thinking about the Z-axis, which I don't really think about in uh, in CSS. Absolutely. And you have to think about what we call the preserve 3D, which means that the back plane is not drawn on top of the front plane. We have to deal with kind of things that will slowly draw you to use uh, WebGL. Okay, so talk more about Preserve 3D and why that's important. It's important because if you want to draw, to draw in 3D, we need to have some kind of depth buffer. I mean, you need to ensure that the pixel you are drawing is in front of the previous pixel. And to do that, we have a, a tool in the, uh, using CSS called Preserve 3D, which means that if a plane is drawn and this plane is... Um, farther than the plane which is drawn on top of it, then mm -hmm. all the 3D will be preserved. So you will have the feeling of a 3D because everything will be drawn in the right order. I see. So then that transform style value that you would put on a div can be either preserve 3D or flat. Absolutely. And if you don't want preserve 3D, it will just be, as you said, flat. I see. And it sounds like that's about as far as you can go in, in, in CSS. I mean, it, it, it provides some ability to, to rotate and turn things around. But if I were going to draw something like a sphere, it's definitely time to get into Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would be really challenging. I saw a lot of experiments that only use CSS, but it's just for really genius guys. If you want to really do 3D, like a sphere, contours, whatever you need, WebGL. Mm -hmm. I was familiar uh, early on with SVG, and when I, as a, as an old school HTML person, I think about markup first. Hmm. I think about markup first. So when I started looking into WebGL, I started kind of searching around, and ignorantly, I was trying to look for what do the angle brackets look like? And then I finally figured out that WebGL is a JavaScript API entirely. There's no angle bracket representation of these objects, are there? Absolutely. There is um, a project launched by the front of our university from Germany called X3DOM, which is exactly what you are talking about as a, a group, a set of um, HTML elements that describe a 3D scene. But right now, if you're thinking about, uh, can, uh, about WebGL, it's like comparing Canvas and SVG. They both draw 2D stuff on the screen. One is based on a, a model like the canvas, which just JavaScript orders, and SVG is more about HTML elements. Right okay. now, we just have WebGL, which is the canvas for 3D, and X3DOM, which is some kind of SVG for the 3D. So you're saying X, the letter X, the uh, number the letter 3, and then the word DOM. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, a uh, would you say, even a declarative 3D? It's a uh, way yeah. of saying, here's a scene, here's a viewport, here's a background, here's a shape, and describing it. So in the context of something like XML that listeners might be familiar with, I could use a DOM API and build the tree procedurally, or I could build the tree declaratively, and you're saying that X3 DOM is the beginning of the discussion around how to describe a 3D scene declaratively. Absolutely, and they try to make it really uh, convenient to use. You can think about uh, XAML when we tr when we introduce 3D in XAML. It's almost the same thing. We have uh, a tag for scene, a tag for camera, a tag for materials. Everything is declarative. And are people who who work in 3D going to be uh, familiar with these terms? This idea of like a scene and a camera and yeah, the angle. Absolutely. So was WebGL created with those th people in mind who are already making 3D content? No, not at all. It's really a low-level uh, API. It's more like DirectX for the web. I mean, you just have a control over a drawing triangle, and then you have to define a global state 
machine and you have to specify really low level things that communicate with the GPU, meaning shaders, um, state like alpha, manipulation of the geometries, everything that it's not high level at all. That's interesting that you say that because I went up to a website called Learning WebGL oh, yeah. and they have an example where they drew a triangle and a square. And I started, I said, Oh, I'll do a view source and this will be lovely. And I can see in here square vertex position buffer and they're making arrays of data and vertices. And I was immediately overwhelmed and frankly a little disappointed, uh, because I'm, I'm sure that from a, from the perspective of someone who does 3D all the time, they might say, ah, these are familiar APIs to DirectX, but to someone who just wants a square, it was immediately overwhelming. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is exactly the price you have to pay today if you want to use the raw power of your GPU. You have to go really at a low level, communicating with your GPU, but in a really harsh to understand way. Mm -hmm. So is that why the kind of the next obvious thing is to uh, use an API on top of that, like whether it be Babylon or, or, or some of your competitors? Uh, it's 3GS, mainly 3GS. 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 Yeah. yeah, it's exactly why four years ago, uh, Mr. Dupes, the creator and the author of uh, 3GS, started working on 3GS. And it's exactly why we decided with some friends in France to create Babylon JS, uh, a way for web developers to continue using JavaScript like they want without having have all the burden of the, the plumbing of WebGL. Mm -hmm. Mr. Doob, D-O-O-B, is Ricardo Cabello from Absolutely. Spain, and he is uh, the creator of 3.js, and people can go and search for that as well. And the, the idea behind these is to layer more familiar um, metaphors and more familiar terms on top of that low-level API? Exactly. We are talking about camera, light, object, textures, something... Sounds more like a, a movie, you know, you are a movie creator and you put your camera, you are looking at something and it's easier to understand when you are not a genius in 3D and maths. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm definitely not, but I do want to make, uh, you know, interactions without having to do the low level stuff. Would anyone want to use the low level stuff who isn't a library provider? Is there any reason for a listener who's learning about WebGL for the first time to call these low level APIs or should they always consider using something higher level? I think that in almost all the case, the high-level frameworks are enough. And if you want to use low-level just at a specific moment, you can. It's not something that is a black box. All the frameworks that are working on top of WebGL are really open. So you can do whatever you want with the low-level API but and keep continuing using the framework itself. Ah, okay. So that if I decide to go and create something in Babylon or in 3... If I need to do something very low level, I, I don't have to really ask the uh, library to get out of the way. It's not hiding everything. No, absolutely. We try to do that on every piece of Babylon JS, for instance. Each time we do something, there is an event that allow you to take the control over the specific features. For instance, you want to add shadows and you don't want to do that the way we are doing, then you just have to uh, overwrite, let's say, uh, the, the specific uh, behavior we are working on and write your own. And in this case, you will have to discuss with WebGL. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I wrote a little blog post about making 3D games in a browser and I talk about both Babylon and 3. And... Uh, Right off the bat, you make an engine and a scene, and then you set up your camera. Yep. Uh, you can also set up a directional light, and you're describing these um, coordinates in XYZ space, but it wasn't clear to me what those numbers meant in the sense of, are we talking about pixels or feet or arbitrary? How do I know? You know, I said, like, I think I set up a camera at, like, one comma this comma that, but I don't really understand where I was setting that camera because yeah. I didn't have a sense of um, of a unit. Yeah, the, the, and this is a funny thing. There is no unit. <laughs> uh, the unit, for instance, if you create a, a vector like zero, one, zero, then the one is whatever you want. It can, it can be one meter, one centimeter. Sorry, I'm French, so I use meter and centimeter. Uh, or one mile, so whatever you need. Uh, it's just up to you to keep that constraint. I mean, if you consider that one unit is one meter, then each time you will build a cube of one by one by one, then it will be one by one by one meter. 
There mm. is no um, fourth unit. Okay, so it's whatever unit makes me happy. Absolutely. I see. So if I have some existing 3D content or an application that has some expectations, as long as those measurements are relative to each other in a reasonable way, I could use those. those uh, absolutely. This is exactly how it works. Oh, okay. So I could go from 0 to 100 or 0 to 1. It doesn't uh, really matter. Yeah. We try to keep value, let's say, from 0 to 1,000 because it's clear. But if you want to go from 0 to 1 million, it's possible. Mm -hmm. So in, in Babylon, once I've set up my engine, my scene, I've set up my camera up, maybe I've added a little bit of light, uh, you've got this thing called a mesh? Yep. What is the mesh that? It's an object. It's the object. It's a geometry. A mesh is a group of geometry and a lot of information like position, scaling, rotation. Is it visible? Is it invisible? Is it almost transparent? All the things that help Babylon GS render an object on the screen. Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. So if I said babylon.mesh.createbox, this is something that you're dealing with internally. Like you have these API, you have these, these functions where you know what a box looks like and you've just set up a series of shapes. Egg. Absolutely. This is exactly how it works. You create, we call create box and then internally, internally, sorry, I'm creating all the uh, vertex, all the dots in space and I uh, gather them using faces to give you a box. Mm -hmm. And how many different kinds of uh, primitive objects do you provide? We have box, sphere, torus, torus knot, um, and plane, and I think I'm done. A torus is like a donut? Yeah, it's a donut. It's a donut. And a uh -huh. torus knot is a double donut. Ah, okay. So what do I do though when I've got, uh, you know, some existing 3D asset, like I see on Skype here that you have Kosh from Babylon 5. Let's say I have a 3D model of Kosh that I made in some other application. And this is something we are really working on. We try to make as simple as possible for the developer to get data from the 3D world. So for instance, we have uh, an exporter from Blender, which is a free 3D modeling tool. And we also uh, have an excellent 3ds Max exporter, so you just have to bring some DLL into your 3ds Max installation folder, and then you will be able to just push a button, and everything that you have into 3ds Max will be um, uh, saved into a .babylon file, and from your JavaScript code, you just have one line of code to load this .babylon file. So instead of having a box, cube, and whatever you can just create using JavaScript, you will be able to have your Kosh, uh, Volon object, or whatever spaceship you need to, to have. So from the point of view of HTML and JavaScript, this ba .babylon file is a set of vertices. It's a, it's a format. I presume it's some kind of JSON format? Is it a JSON format? Yeah, we wanted to keep it simple as possible. And it's... Everything related to a scene. I mean, there is light inside, materials, textures, uh, obviously the meshes, all the objects and the geometries, everything that you need to have a full scene. If you go to babylongs.com, you will see a lot of really complex scenes we created with 3ds Max Explorer, and there are just one Babylon file. So if I go up there right now, I'm at Babylon JS. The most impressive one, the one that's blown my mind, is the Assassin's Creed Pirates, because I play Assassin's Creed, and this is a ship racing game. Absolutely. Um, and then when I hit that, and you know, it takes a moment to load, what all is, is happening here? Is this megabytes of information? Oh, yeah. I think that the size of all the scene, meaning every kind of weather, the weather, all the textures for the ships, is around 40 megabytes of data. 40 megabytes. And this yeah, isn't four zero. 40 megabytes of JSON. I presume that the next step beyond the structures in the scene is the textures. Yep. The textures are pretty easy, and we are using something really interesting, which is the DDS. DDS is a compressed format, and 
uh, as the opposite of using a, a JPEG, for instance, JPEG is also compressed, but, but when you want to download the JPEG into the GPU memory, you have to uncompress it and save it uncompressed into the GPU memory. Mm -hmm. For With DDS, we have the ability to just load the, DD, the DDS like it, save it into the GPU memory, and the GPU is able to uncompress it when it needs to render your objects, for instance. Mm -hmm. And DDS, was that not direct draw surfaces, the name of where that Absolute. originally came from? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's an invention of Microsoft. But that's now something that everyone uses. Yeah, and we have a lot of uh, global documentation around. Mm -hmm. So this is a... Uh, it sounds scary, all these different formats and three-letter acronyms, but that really is just another kind of compressed picture. It's It's like a JPEG or a PNG. Absolutely, it's like a JPEG. Mm -hmm. But if I understand correctly, this format is 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 a little bit lossy, right? Yep. But the compression ratio is fixed. There's basically like how how compressed do you want it, and it's fixed, and it can be uh, decompressed by the hardware. So the work for decompressing this can happen in the GPU itself. Yeah, and in this case, it saves a lot of memory because if you have to save an uncompressed JPEG in memory, it will take a lot of megabytes of memory. But with the DDS, because it remains compressed, then you save a lot of bandwidth Ah, so and it remains compressed in memory as opposed to a JPEG that turns into a yeah. bitmap. And we've all been to web pages before that have uh, huge JPEGs and our browser gets slowed down because it's really just a giant bitmap in memory. Absolutely. Ah, okay. So then the GPU, again, another example of using the GPU to the fullest, uh, does the decompression in the hardware as it needs to. Yes. And if you take the example of Assassin's Creed Pirate, the demonstration we did here, if you look at the skybox, I mean the, the sky, then the sky needs six different textures because you have to think about uh, a box that is surrounding all the scene. And each time you look around, then the 3D engine is showing you the right face of the cube and you have this impression of being uh, surrounded by a, a true sky. And to do that, we need six different JPEG or just one DDS because the DDS also has the ability to save many files in it. Mm -hmm. We call that the cube texture. Ah, okay. Now, I made, uh, by stealing someone else's code, because that seems to be the way things are done on the web, uh, <laughs> a, a spinning cube with texture in space, and I tried to make them look the same. I did one in Babylon and one in 3JS, and conceptually, they were very similar. We had scenes and a cube geometry, and I applied a texture. Uh, but one of the things that I noticed immediately was that in Babylon, I can grab the cube and spin it around. I had interaction, but I don't remember writing any of that work. Yeah, and you're right. This is the foundation of Babylon GS. This is why we decided to create something different than 3GS. 3GS is an excellent 3D engine, but we wanted to have something with a different philosophy. We wanted something that is really simple to use. No need to add code. If you can do something basically without no code at all, then we will do that for you. For instance, as you mentioned, we uh, add support for touch, we add support for manipulation, we add support for everything that we can add without giving you the burden of doing it. Does that take Babylon kind of f forward, not necessarily as a, as a 3D library, but more of a game engine? Yeah, we think about it as a game engine. We wanted to think about it like the XNA for the web. Ah, interesting. Now, I also notice, and this is just subjective, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but it feels like the cube in my my uh, Babylon example has somehow smoother sides, while in 3JS it ended up a little bit aliased. Is that an illusion that I'm seeing? Uh, we are working a lot with uh, two different perception things. When you want to make it rotate, we add some inertia so it feels like it's more 
smooth. And about rendering, we also add some specific post-process effects to add um, anti-aliasing on all the rendering we are doing. I see. So this, again, gets to that point that you're you're optimizing for a certain audience, uh, perhaps. And again, we're not trying to speak for the author of 3JS, but that, that seems a little bit closer to the metal. I'm sure that I could add the post-processing and the anti-aliasing, sure. as well as the manipulation. Uh, but you're doing that for free, so you're trying to basically make me successful without me having to be very, very good at 3D work. Yeah, we, we try to add a lot of things for you, and instead of asking you to add things, I prefer asking you to remove things. Ah, interesting. So then in order to, I would add things to the 3JS example to get manipulation, and I would have to turn them off in Babylon. Absolutely. It's exactly the philosophy. Mm-hmm. Now, I was looking at the Assassin's Creed example, and it appears that it was made by the IE team, uh, along with the folks at uh, at Ubisoft. Yes, it's a partnership between IE team and Ubisoft. We wanted to showcase the fact that, as you mentioned just at the start of this uh, show, the web is almost ready for gaming. I mean, true gaming, t- triple A gaming, and Ubisoft is convinced that we will be able to have really great games without any plugin in a browser. So the, you, they really think that's going to happen. So that means that uh, I would be able to get a you know a Steam quality game at some point, like Bastion or some game that perhaps is already cross-platform and run that in the browser just fine. I mean, we've we've all seen Quake and the examples. There's always the yes. the Wolfenstein 3D in the browser, but they're talking about like. Assassin's Creed quality games. Yes. Right now we have to figure out some specific points like IP protection and how to monetize things. So it's just a beginning. Technically, we can create games. This is not a problem of technical stuff or JavaScript or whatever. We have the the raw power and access to the GPU. It's more about monetization and how to protect my assets. So the... We have full access to the GPU, and the browser's not keeping us from that. We know that JavaScript, from a speed perspective, is near native speed right now and certainly getting faster every day. Uh, there's memory issues, presumably. Uh, people aren't used to a browser taking up maybe four or 500 megs of RAM like a game is, but I'm sure they can get over that. Uh, what about storage and caching? Do I, If I want to play Assassin's Creed, I'm going to go on Steam and download 15 gigabytes of uh, and and store all of that. If I was going to play the equivalent game in the browser, would you have the browser kind of keep a ring buffer of just the textures and the information I need for the current level, and then maybe, or would I just cache it all and have a five or ten gig uh, browser cache? For Babylon JS, what we decided to do is to use IndexedDB, the database of the web, uh, to save everything locally. So this this means that the first time you will connect to the game, we will download for you everything into the local database, meaning that if you want to go offline, you can play. You can still play the game even offline because all the textures and the resources are saved locally. We have obviously some limitation uh, when it come to speak about space we can go to 100 megabytes um, it's the limitation we have uh, but it's it's just a good a first idea we can do a lot of things with uh, local cache we have to figure out how to do that like you do that in stream for instance mm-hmm. Yeah, it is amazing, though, how much you can do with not a huge amount of data. Uh, there's this really cool example uh, on Babylon JS called Hill Valley. That is yeah. uh, basically it's the space where Marty McFly, uh, <laughs> you know, parks his car and goes to the uh, clock tower. It's an incredibly complicated scene. I mean, it's effectively the entire town square. You can walk around, and it's only about seventy megabytes. Yep, and we added a lot of Easter eggs. If you want to wander around, we added some really cool stuff around. And it's just 70, as you said, megabytes. And it's just JSON. We are working on a more compressed file format to save bytes right now. And I'm pretty sure that we can do that with just 50 megabytes. Really? You know, it would, it would yep. be very interesting to compare what an application written in a traditional gaming language you know, looks like taking something that's like uh, maybe this Hill Valley example in C or C++ and how that would be different uh, versus writing it in JavaScript. I mean, is this not just 
trying to get it to work in the browser, but is it really a superior way to deliver a 3D game? Yes, you can reach a lot of people with just a browser right mm-hmm. now. We can reach every people that have a computer today is able to get a browser. It's free. You can just download it and it will work. Now, as I'm wandering around, I'm, I'm flying around uh, Hill Valley right now. Um, and of course, I can I have God mode, so I can go in and out of walls and things. Um, I noticed that some of the textures look amazing uh, far away, but if I get close up, then I can see I can see the JPEGiness. Um, yes. Could you have different levels of textures like you see in 3D games where it gets better quality as it begins to pop in? Yeah, if we wanted to do that, we can just add some DDS because DDS integrates uh, features called MIP mapping. And MIP mapping is a level of quality for textures. If you are closer to a texture, then the texture will be extremely neat and precise. And if you are going further, then we will use a different level of MIP map. Uh, the, the, the functionality works like this. You have the full range which is the first level, let's say 1,000 by 1,000. Mm-hmm. And you have a second level of MIP map, which is just the, divided by two. So let's say 500 by 500 and so on and so on. And automatically, WebGL is able to pick the right one based on your distance from the object that you are looking at. I see. So then it becomes uh, a really uh, an asset management problem more than it's anything else. It's not an issue of code. This is just the to the limits of my artist's ability to create textures. If I ask my artist to redo this scene with this scene with just DDS, then this problem will go away. So I just got inside the car here and something happened. I'm not sure if that's one of the Easter eggs. I got inside Marty's DeLorean and then some some kind of cool effect occurred. <laughs> I think you find one of them. I'm going to have to explore this. This is pretty amazing stuff. Do you think that this is going to ha- we're going to see more people getting involved in game creation because it's such a more um accessible way to do it? Oh, yeah, I think so. If you are looking at what Unity announced, Unity 3D announced for their version 5, they will be able to directly export any Unity game into a full WebGL stuff. Look at also what Firefox is doing with ASN.js, and uh, it's all around us. I'm pretty sure that, yeah, let's say in three or perhaps four years, there will be a lot of WebGL games. That's really interesting. The idea that, that JavaScript is a compilation target, you're saying WebGL and JavaScript as a compilation target where... Uh, toolkits like Unity that are already almost game generators, someone could simply say export as web-based game. Yeah, and it's something that you already noticed on your own blog when you was talking about JavaScript is the assembler of the web. Yeah. Right right now, JavaScript is just the support of everything that if you want to just be fully cross-platform. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, David, for chatting with me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. You can go up and learn more about Babylon JS at babylonjs.com, and I'll put links in the show notes to David on Twitter and his blog and uh, also his GitHub. This has been another episode of Cancer Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.